For the past few weeks now, I've been playing around with the Logitech G Cloud. They actually sent me to do a sponsored video, which I did do, but secretly, this is what I really wanted to do with the system. Honestly, I've become a little bit bored of retro handhelds that can't quite manage to play the kind of games that I want to throw at them. Okay, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to hear me, but I'm completely blown away by this emulator. I've finally got it running at a solid 30 frames a second, even in the water. I could never get that working before, so I'm so happy. So was the G-Cloud a better experience overall? And what are the possibilities when you actually push this to its limits? Let's find out. So the G-Cloud runs Android, which means that right out of the gate I had access to hundreds of different emulators on the Play Store. Having some bad experience with Android consoles in the past though, I was very excited to try out Android on a much more capable device than what I'm used to. So I downloaded a bunch of emulators, some I even ended up paying for to unlock some of the pro features. I spent a while configuring all of these standalone apps and I had a pretty good time overall, but it felt kind of messy having all of these different apps that I needed to open and close depending on what games I wanted to play and what systems. But then I remembered something that my friend showed me called Daiji Show, which is actually a secondary operating system slash launcher for Android, which allows you to collate all of your games into one system and then you can actually flick through and choose the emulator that you want right from that one app. So I did some googling and downloaded it and it turns out that it was a fantastic idea. Instead of using the G Cloud in either handheld mode or tablet mode, I can actually set Daiji Show as the default launcher for this device. So whenever I turn the G Cloud on though, it actually goes straight into this Android front end by default and I can flick through and choose any of the systems and any of the games that I've got installed on here. And I've got a lot at this point. There's so many options with this launcher and it was a little bit overwhelming, but there's loads of great tutorials out there on YouTube. So if you are interested in getting it set up like I have, then I'll put some links in the description for some really nice easy tutorials for you to follow. It's a really nice operating system too, you can scrape a database to fill all your list of games with screenshots and even videos for all the different games too. And there's a widgets area as well where you can add things like retro achievements which I'll get back to a bit later on, as well as things like launching a random game or launching the last game that you played, things like that. So there's a load of really great stuff here. And I did go a little bit crazy and I've added thousands of games ranging all the way from the NES to the GameCube and the PlayStation 2. And what made this so easy to use was the fact that if you don't have an emulator installed, it will actually recommend you one by default. So it easily takes you to the store and it allows you to download the exact emulator that you need in order to get things up and running. And this is great, but it's still a little bit messy in the back end and you end up with hundreds of different apps for all your different systems. And emulators on Android can be very hit and miss. And like I said earlier, you do actually need to pay for some of them in order to unlock some of the pro features. And I actually paid for some and then it turned out that it's not fully compatible with the G-Code either. A lot of the classic Android issues reared their ugly head here. Things like unskippable adverts on some of the emulators to things like not being able to get rid of the on-screen controls even though it's got buttons on this device here. And each emulator also has its own completely different settings menus and different things that you need to toggle on and off in order to get a stable frame rate and it's just too much. There had to be an easier way. So even though I was kind of happy, it was still a hit or miss experience, and I knew I wanted better. So I was scrolling through the list of emulators on Daiji Show here, and I noticed that a lot of them actually had alternatives within RetroArch. So I had a look online and I downloaded a specific version of RetroArch just for Android, and the great thing about that is that you can download something called Emulator Cores, which are basically emulators but within the RetroArch system itself. So rather than downloading a bunch of random different emulators from random different developers, you can actually download them within RetroArch itself, which I personally have found to be a much better and simpler method of getting all my games to play from one place. So with a lot more tweaking, I managed to change all the emulator settings to look at the RetroArch cores instead. And I have to say doing that has improved my experience a lot. And I've been having an absolutely great time. I've spent more time tweaking all of the settings than actually playing the games. But I have to say that for the majority of the systems, at least everything up to Dreamcast, for example, you can play them 
perfectly fine on the G Cloud. And now let me come back to the topic of retro achievements, which is something that I only just found out about as well. Well, I've known about it for a long time, but as you probably know, I prefer playing on actual official systems. But thanks to things like this, I've actually started considering getting a lot more into emulation, especially with the fact that I found a way of recording games on here too, which is great for YouTube. But anyway, retro achievements is basically allowing you to get achievements for all the retro games that you play on RetroArch, which is just fantastic. There's loads of different achievements for the majority of games at this point. Basically, Retro Achievements is a brand new way to breathe life into these classic games. You can sign up on RetroAchievements.com and then when you play the games on an emulator which supports it, you can unlock achievements and even compete in online leaderboards. This was so cool and it's so fun to see what kind of challenges it throws at you with all these different games. So I set everything up to Dreamcast runs perfectly on here, but what about some of the more demanding systems? Well, I tried PSP and I'm very happy with the results here as well. There were a few issues in RetroArch where the PSP emulator actually booted up in portrait mode rather than landscape, so I had to do a bit more tweaking in order to get it to actually face the right way. But once I did, I'm very impressed. And I have to say that this is actually a better way of playing PSP games than on the actual PSP. PSP itself. The massive 1080p screen on this is just incredible and it's so nice to be able to play those games on such a nice display. It is a little bit of a shame that the system isn't quite powerful enough to allow you to boost that internal resolution to make it run at a native 1080p. Honestly, that would be the dream. Having this system and to be able to run retro games at full native 1080p on this would just be the dream come true. But unfortunately, it really can't hit that with stable frame rate. You're pretty much limited to just the resolution of the original systems, honestly. But I'm still not done. I wanted to push this system even further, so I tried out some Wii and GameCube games. And at first, it did leave a lot to be desired. I couldn't get anywhere higher than about 10 or 15 frames a second. But it turns out there's actually a second version of the GameCube emulator that I was running, which is actually made for these lower end Android systems. It's actually called the MMJR version of Dolphin. And using this actually improved the performance considerably. And now, to my complete surprise and astonishment, I can actually play things like Wind Waker and Twilight Princess at full 30 frames a second native resolution. My mind was just blown. And Wii games, honestly, aren't that much further away. I can almost play things like Sonic Colors at full speed. Honestly, apart from the audio being a little bit glitchy, this is perfectly playable, and it is way more than I thought this system would be capable of. But not content with ending it at just Wii, I did try and push it a little bit further and tried out 3DS, and let's just say that was a mistake. There is no way that this system can play 3DS games at anywhere near a playable frame rate. I attempted to play Kid Icarus Uprising on here, and the results speak for themselves. On the GameCube front, some of the more harder to emulate games like F-Zero or Mario Sunshine did still suffer even with this new emulator and I don't think there's any more settings that I can tweak to get any extra performance out of them unfortunately. So if you are hoping to play things like Mario Sunshine on this, then you're probably better off going for something a little bit more powerful like a Steam Deck. I also tried PS2 on here and I was very pleasantly surprised with the performance on that. I managed to play things like Burnout 2 at even higher than native resolution and it played perfectly fine. And Burnout 2 is one of my favourite racing games of all time, so I was so happy. I've actually been really enjoying playing that on here. Burnout 3 is, of course, a lot more demanding, and I couldn't quite get Burnout 3 to run properly, though. Some PS2 games do seem to run fine, so if you're thinking about getting this for playing PS2 games, depending on the game, you might be happy. And then I actually noticed that Daijisho had an option for Switch games, and I thought there's absolutely no way in hell that Switch is going to run on this, but I thought I'd give it a try. Turns out that getting Switch to run here is a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. 